from different geographical uh, region has got distinct uh, mutation frequencies. Therefore, it is very important to assess these mutations from each and every uh, geographical regions and also the association of these mutations uh, to drug resistance. Mutation ARG463 is not a target in our current diagnostic uh, essays. Only codon 315 is uh, from the KG hotspot region, INHA. reported that this mutation is responsible for 20 to 40 percent of INH phenotypical resistance, especially low level resistance. So the aim of the study was to assess the frequency of this mutation uh, from two uh, provinces in South Africa. So what happened is we selected, randomly selected 100 empty RTB cultures that were more than 20 years old and we uh, did a line uh, probe to confirm if they are MDR, if they are resistant to rifampicin and INH using the line probe assay. We also sequenced, we did whole genome sequencing on all 100 of those uh, uh, MDR cultures just to characterize the genes and mutations that are responsible for phenotypic uh, uh, MTB resistance. So our results showed that out of 100 phenotypical isoniazid resistant, 14 isolate had this mutation, the RG463 mutation, and seven of those 14 were from the Western Cape province, and uh, that the mutation came with other additional uh, mutations, especially uh, the serin 315. And then from the Gauteng province of South Africa, the ARG463 came up alone with no additional mutation. If you look at this table, you can see that the, the ARG463 here at the top from the Western Cape province, it came up with other additional mutations and there was a concordance between uh, all three essays that we use. And then from the Gauteng province, we saw that the ARG463 came up alone and there was discordance between LJ and LPA. So we assume that this mutation was responsible for phenotypic resistance. It may happen that it's other uh, genes that were responsible. And then also what was interesting is that this mutation was associated in 14 of the 13 isolates. This mutation was associated with the Belgian lineage and one was uh, an X3 lineage. So ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, I would like to say if this mutation is incorporated in our current diagnostic essay, there could be a high discriminatory power. And also we can see, we, we saw that it is more associated with virulent Belgian lineage. Also, in conclusion, I would like to say if we want to accelerate towards elimination, it is very important that we include targets that are really responsible for phenotypic resistance of uh, 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 TB. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. All right. So, so my question is, um, I think there's, there's concern that INH mono resistance is, is chronically underdiagnosed in, in countries. Uh, what would you and your co-authors suggest? Uh, how would we advocate to countries to increase the amount of testing that's done for INH resistance? Okay. There's a study that was done in South Africa by Cohen, whereby uh, she suggested that during drug resistance, INH is the first drug to acquire resistance. So I think the drug uh, uh, resistant... Um, uh, 
SA developers should look into that when they are developing their SA, especially for the gene expect. Remember, it, it, it only detects rifampicin. I think it will be very important that uh, the, 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 the patients are not treated on empty um, MDR based only on RIF mono resistant. They should first confirm if the patient is not isoniazid resistant before administering treatment. All right, questions? Yes, I am Gabriela Torrea from the Institute of Tropical Medicine. Uh, I would like uh, to know if you have uh, done the DST to know the level of resistance of this, of the strains uh, harboring this mutation, because it's important to know uh, since there are some treatment for MDR that even if there are, they are uh, resistance, low level, the isoniazid is uh, okay. uh, included in the regimen. Okay, because our uh, isolates were more than 20 years old, so they were non-viable, so we couldn't do uh, MICs, but then we are currently busy collecting fresh isolates and then trying to find this mutation and do MIC to see if it is really responsible for phenotypic resistance and whether high level or low level resistance. Thank you. Other questions? <laughs> yes, Claudia. Thank you. This, obviously, no one else has one. I think there's a bit of an elephant in the room uh, with this mutation. There is some concern in the literature that this could actually be a phylogenetic mutation, uh, and it often occurs together with other mutations. You see that in some of your data. Did you also look at other genes, such as uh, FABG1, to see whether there are mutations there? Obviously, we don't know completely how the resistance is determined for um, for INH, but I think the known targets like FABG, INHA would be worthwhile looking at to see whether you see any co-associated mutations with this mutation, because again, I think there is some data to suggest that this is a phylogenetic mutation not associated with resistance. Okay. Okay, and Unf unfortunately, we on I only looked at the KG and the INHA genes, but because I did whole genome, so I'd look at the other genes. Yes, so FAPG1, okay. yes, definitely. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? We have one more minute. No? All right, then thank you very much, Don Tutu. <laughs> and next up, we have uh, Rohini Sharma. And we now have actually a number of uh, people coming from Ames, powerhouse, powerhouse of India. So welcome. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Here I will here I will discuss about the high degree of fluoroquinolone resistance among pulmonary TB patients at tertiary care center in North India. So the basic concept of this was that to evaluate the uh, fluoroquinolone resistance among uh, pulmonary TB cases. So as we all know that the fluoroquinolone uh, group of antibiotics are the backbone drug for the management of the MDR tuberculosis. And uh, in India, mostly in day-to-day uh, -day clinical practice, uh, the routine drug susceptibility testing for the uh, second-line drugs, and especially for the fluoroquinolones, is not being performed, and the patients are being uh, treated empirically. So, uh, a limited uh, information regarding fluoroquinolone resistance among pulmonary TB is existing in India. So the basic concept of this study was to estimate the fluoroquinolone resistance among drug sensitive and uh, drug uh, resistant pulmonary TB cases from Delhi. So here we can see that um, uh, this was the uh, flow of my study and uh, the recruitment of the patient was done on the basis of a smear positive uh, sputum specimens were recruited and then uh, they were subjected to the uh, uh, liquid culture and uh, based on that uh, we uh, 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 selected uh, 14 uh, 99 patients 
and apart from that we did the first line DST and second line DST and then we concluded that uh, we got 249 MDR patients and then we got uh, fluoroquinolone mono resistance were up to 27.4 percent and on the other hand we evaluated uh, we did the same thing uh, on the drug susceptible uh, isolates also and we got uh, 3.1 percent of fluoroquinolone monoresistance cases uh, among drug sensitive cases so here this was the drug susceptibility patterns uh, of uh, mdr tb isolates and uh, here i'm just focusing on uh, uh, flux mono resistant which I got 27.3% uh, 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 here and this is the table which is going to define that uh, among drug sensitive isolates 3.1% of uh, patients were found to be resistance and uh, among MDR as I repeated again that 27.3 uh, so it is alarmingly very high in India so this is very alarming situation in uh, India about the management of the second line drugs that should be uh, very crucially treated and where to treat so in conclusion I would like to say that uh, fluoroquinolone mono resistant amok drug sensitive and MDR TB isolates is alarmingly high and based on these findings DST of fluoroquinolone should be routinely performed to avoid further uh, amplification of drug resistance and now uh, India is eagerly waiting for its first nationalized drug resistance surveillance uh, which is, was conducted by National Tuberculosis uh, uh, Institute NTI Bangalore and uh, by this uh, uh, report we can uh, calculate the actual burden of drug resistance uh, including uh, uh, drug wise so that we can uh, evaluate ourselves that where we are standing right now thank you Thank you very much, Rohini. Very interesting data. Um, do you have any idea? I know you're waiting for the surveillance data, but do you have any idea how this compares currently to other places in India? And where do you think all of that fluoroquinolone resistance is coming from? Where's, where, what is the underlying issue here? Yeah, it is somehow... Uh yeah, it is uh, somehow uh, very near to the other states, uh, which has also conducted that uh, uh, estimation of fluoroquinolone loan resistance. One study was conducted at Gujarat, India, and uh, it was uh, concluded that up to 24.3% uh, 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 is the actual uh, of flux uh, monoresistant uh, burden is uh, there. And uh, in Delhi, it is being under publication and very soon it is going to be published so uh, from Delhi it is coming up to 27 percent and for the drug sensitive cases I think this was the first study which is going to point out uh, of the fluoroquinolone mono resistant up among drug sensitive cases and yet more studies is to be come out from India that's all and any comment on the underlying problem? Why do we see so much more monoresistance to fluoroquinolones than in other parts of the world? Yeah, actually, uh, I'm a uh, non-clinician, but uh, what I see and I, what I face uh, that uh, uh, if a patient is coming uh, towards the OPD and he has a simple cough and uh, those uh, clinicians used to treat him uh, with a group of fluoroquinolones and immediately he uh, gets uh, cured and he feels that he's a... Uh, quite well so in that case I think uh, it should be strictly and uh, adhere to the this tuberculosis uh, program and the clinician should also be very strict about this use of the fluoroquinolone thus we can I think that we can stop the misuse of this mm. important thank drug. You. yes thank you any questions from the audience we have a few more minutes if not I think <laughs> So please feel free to, to ask additional questions. We don't want to uh, take the, the whole stage. Um, but I, I do uh, tend to, to agree that I think it's probably the use of fluoroquinolones in the, in the public and private sector, which is a, yeah, a, a exactly. complicated problem in yes. India, uh, yeah. because how do you regulate quinolone use in, in both the public and private sector? It's, it's quite a big problem to solve. Uh, I was curious about... Uh, 
I think it will be essential to look at both OFLOX, LEVAFLOX, and MOXIFLOX uh, resistance. A lot of countries, I think, have just yeah. implemented OFLOX, and then you're a bit stuck deciding yeah, about the quinolones. we did that also, but the data oh. is not presented here. Oh, it is great. some of I'm going to present in some of them. Brilliant. That's yeah. great. Yeah. And uh, the empiric regimen that patients get, I'm not sure if you know, while you're waiting for quinolone resistance DST, what, what's the regimen? Oh, Do you know? Uh, those who are uh, resistant to uh, Oflox. Right. No, before, you know no, before you know that, sorry. Before I know. Mm. Yeah. The initial empiric regimen. They are just uh, kept on uh, uh, those uh, regimen, and then after that they are they are just kept on uh, uh, on that uh, treatment regimen, and after that uh, the DST results are available, and then they are defined that yes they are resistant to that, then they uh, shift to another treatment regimen. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, Tom Ziegler from Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Very nice presentation. Um, given my understanding that many or most of these drugs are over the counter and freely available in India, are there policies, are there any policy changes in underway to potentially make these drugs less available to the public? Yeah, definitely. Uh, nowadays, uh, the RNTCP program of uh, India is very strict on this, and uh, thus uh, it has been uh, now some guidelines are being there just to uh, stop the misuse of this uh, fluoroquinolones, and especially uh, to the management of uh, drug resistant of tuberculosis. So I think uh, very soon uh, we are going to uh, India is going to be um, stand for universal DST, and at that moment uh, the these things are being kept in the mind of these uh, policy makers which are uh, strict, uh, strictly working hard in the India and then we can have this uh, strict rules for the use of fluoroquinolones. Thank you. Maybe one more quick question for the last few seconds. Molecular tests, what about the rollout of second line LPA to accelerate uh, detection of fluoroquinolone resistance so that patients are on the empiric regimen not too long and acquire more resistance? Yeah, that uh, now India has uh, started uh, use of uh, using this uh, second line uh, LPA and now it is uh, being uh, drastically the turnaround time is uh, very few now we can have the uh, data um, uh, uh, the resistant pattern in 48 hours so the India has uh, started this uh, and uh, uh, I think uh, this is going to help uh, a lot in the management of the drug resistant uh, cases in India okay. so India is already uh, doing second LPA super thanks so much Rini. thank you thank <laughs> you yeah we need Right, so uh, next speaker is Binit uh, Kumar Singh from India. Maybe just quickly, because there was one abstract. Uh, Suyun Shin is not in the room, correct? Yes, okay, just making sure. There was one abstract for that was dropped for a reason that we don't know. So just making sure. Second one. Presentation, please. We need the slides, please. Oh. Uh, 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 good morning, uh, respected all and my dear friends. Uh, 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 myself, Beneath, and I'm just going to present my uh, one of the study, uh, uh, the use of uh, uh, genotype uh, MTBR plus uh, version 2 in a smear negative cases. Uh, first of all, just I want to uh, know. Uh, I would just like to uh, uh, inform you that basically we are just uh, in our India. Basically, we are lying on the, the uh, this uh, um, X-ray and uh, genetic smear microscopy for the uh, treatment. Uh, but uh, uh, after the endorsement of uh, LED, but uh, uh, LED microscopy. But uh, uh, again, the seven percent only only seven percent uh, laboratory have the, uh, the that of type facility to uh, to cope this uh, uh, ZN microscopy. And uh, who endorsed also uh, version 1 in 2008, but uh, it's also for the uh, grade 1 uh, high grade uh, smear uh, patient for the uh, in, uh, molecular DST. Uh, my aim of objective is to perform the uh, to, uh, to, uh, to evaluate the version, version 2 line probe assay uh, for the uh, smear negative sputum uh, sample in the uh, uh, MDR TB suspect patients. 
uh, uh, now this is my uh, uh, systemic uh, uh, workflow. Uh, 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 I have uh, I have chosen all this mere negative patients uh, 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 simultaneously uh, liquid culture and uh, line progress. I have implemented all the patients. Uh, 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 I have excluded all the contaminated and the uh, uh, invalid patients for the from this study, and uh, simultaneously the uh, culture uh, culture positive and culture negative. Uh, and invalid uh, valid results and ICT all also done and the uh, NTM is also uh, excluded from this study. Yeah. Uh, now the, when I just compare this study with the uh, liquid culture, uh, just I got the uh, uh, the sensitivity is uh, 68.4 uh, and uh, the specificity is 89.27%. Uh, 80, 89 but uh, but there is uh, uh, there is one question about the false positivity in the smear negative. It's mere negative gene expert positive. Uh, to cope this uh, uh, things, uh, I, I just uh, use the CRS uh, to evaluate the results uh, for, uh, for for my uh, SMA, uh, to to uh, increase uh, to evaluate my smear negative patients uh, 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 to uh, to find out the uh, uh, accurate sensitivity and specificity uh, for line progressive. Uh, for this, I have just. Uh, 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 using liquid cultures, uh, symptoms, and uh, radiological finding and follow up for the two months. Now, after the uh, uh, after the uh, uh, the CRS, uh, I just I got the uh, highest sensitivity than uh, with the culture, and uh, the specificity is also very high because I didn't get any uh, false positive, and uh, PPV and NPV also very uh, good. In respect of uh, uh, this, uh, uh, with the with reference to the culture, uh, and this is basically uh, 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 the resistant pattern we, 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 which I found in the um, uh, line probe assay. And again, uh, for the uh, this this data represents all the uh, MDR patients. Uh, it's also found that the, the most most of the resistant is found in them, uh, the the uh, mute three position. Uh, And uh, this is a basically uh, uh, the resistant pattern, sensitive resistant pattern uh, with the uh, liquid culture. It's also very good for the rifampicin, and the, uh, but the INH it's a little bit low. Now the uh, my uh, in conclusion, just uh, uh, I just conclude that uh, uh, we can uh, uh, we can implement the line probe uh, say for the uh, uh, for the detection of uh, MDR MDR TV at this uh, all the suspect patients and uh, uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, uh, it's also very good for the uh, for the uh, to find out the drug assistant for the refined INH and uh, and it can recommend uh, for the uh, for the sputum smear negative patient in all the MDR suspect patient and the uh, the study, uh, this study, uh, there, uh, there must be some more study uh, to relate this thing. Uh, for that, we will have to go for the, some more sample size so that uh, we can uh, prove it uh, in uh, other scale also. Now, uh, this uh, I just acknowledge my all the team of Department of Medicine uh, from Ames, Nidali. Thank you very much, Pineet. <laughs> very interesting and promising data. If I may ask the first question, I was a bit surprised about if you look at the WHO systematic review that actually led to the recommendation of the second line line progress last year, they found a lot of uh, indeterminates in uh, the smear negatives. Uh, and uh, you actually have a relatively low rate. Uh, any idea? The why that could have been? Actually, uh, for uh, for uh, I have just taken uh, all the patients from MDR suspect patient. That's why I, I couldn't get that type of result. But uh, uh, you are just talking about the uh, 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 for second line LPA. Huh? For second line, right, so the invalids on the sec in the second line LPA. In se in second line LPA, but exactly. um, in our lab we have still not started the second line LPA. It's under evaluation from our site. So. Uh, this is for the version one. Uh, uh I know, sorry, uh, sorry, that was my my bad. I mean, for the for the first line, for the MTR, the version 2.0. That's why I got confused just now. Yeah. MTR D, DR plus, yes. Yeah, yeah. So the invalid rate is certainly much higher for both actually the first and second line LPAs in smear negative patients, which was a big concern in the in the WHO systematic review. 
yeah that's why uh, for uh, for that uh, actually for my study i have just taken all the patients from mdr suspect and in uh, one of the uh, and, and the and the, uh, we are also confined on the concentrated smear mm -hmm. that's why we are getting a uh, very good results uh, but uh, uh, the one of modification i did in my uh, in my study is uh, uh, as you know there are five uh, for the dna isolation we are taking uh, 500 microliter but for my study, I have taken one microliter of the sample mm -hmm. for my study, so mm -hmm. that I get the better results. Mm -hmm. If we go for that, then then uh, 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 it will uh, it will have uh, to lessen the invalid results in comparison with the okay. others. So that's a good suggestion, I think, for yeah. others in their labs yeah. to potentially consider that. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience? Yes, you're getting a lot of exercise here too. <laughs> Yes, uh, thank you for your presentation. Yes, uh, the, um, uh, you have used uh, MISHIT as gold standard, yes. but it is known that uh, MISHIT um, uh, missed some uh, disputed mutation. Have you sequenced the cases that are resistant by molecular and susceptible by MISHIT? Uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, I know the MISHIT is a, uh, I have taken MISHIT as a gold standard, but uh, in some a little bit, I a little confused over the uh, question. Will you please repeat it? Sorry. Yes, the question is that uh, um, MISHIT uh, uh, cannot detect some also. mutations yeah. that are the disputed mutations yeah. uh, in the RPOV gene. Yeah. Uh, in that case, is the um, uh, molecular uh, LPA is uh, DST is uh, resistant, and so uh, you should sequence to see, uh, otherwise the, the parameters, the, the sensitivity and the specificity will yeah. not be... For that, uh, uh, that's why I was just saying, ki, uh, for this study we will have to go for the more sample size, because my sample size is only 572, that's why I, do, I don't get that type of uh, uh, that combination in my study. Yes. So if you, you go, the, the if you will go for the um, uh, large study about uh, 1000 to 2000 sample size, then we will definitely yes. get in uh, uh, RPOB and uh, INH both have a discordant sample, because uh, in I, INH there is a, a flux pump is all there so that that shows a, a resistant to the mesid versus sensitive with the line probase uh, and vice versa sometimes but uh, for that we will have to go for the uh, for large sample size and for more drastic study yes but this diffusive mutation can affect more the specificity yes, of the yes, LPA yes, than yes, yes, yes. Uh, that's uh, why it is in fact yes. a problem of the sensitivity yes, of yes, mesid yes 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 Very good. So I think sequencing would be the way to yeah. go in addition yeah. to a larger sample size. Yeah. Any final questions? Yes. From Pakistan. I'm Sabira Desin from Pakistan. My only question is from the clinical point of view, what advantage do you see of uh, using LPA on a smear negative cases rather than using expert for testing these and then going to LPA on the patients who are... Actually, uh, I, I did my study in uh, 2000. My sample size is uh, between uh, 2012 to 2014. That's why. But after that, the line gene expert is implemented for the for this uh, diagnosis purpose. So that I have just evaluated this in because. Uh, but in our separate in our setup, we, we are also going for the line probe say, for the INH mono uh, INH uh, gene expert sensitive for the INH resistant also. That's why we will go for again. We will go for the line probe assay for the version version two line probe assay. That's why we will have to go for line probe also, also line probe also, uh, assay also. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next, also from the All India Institute, is uh, Sarman Singh. And we're not reading titles because we assume that uh, that you can see that on the first slide. Thank you, Chairpersons. My job has been made much easier by a lot of discussion and two previous presentations from the same institute, same part of the country, and a lot of discussions we had with the uh, both learned chairpersons, those who are working on the subject matter. So I come from the All India Medical Sciences, the same institute, and my topic is uh, the genetic uh, mutations associated with the second line. Probably this presentation will uh, work probably 
you are asking about this is the second line lpa which is in the going or the in the evolution stage in india not yet rolled out so this you know uh, gives some insight in the how it performs so the study had you know very focused objectives two objectives the one was uh, to screen the mdr tb isolates to see the frequency of the pre xdr and xdr and to find out if there are genetic mutations which can be associated by the uh, second line lpa and then second objective was to see that if any genotype of the mycobacterium tuberculosis they have some association with the specific mutations so these were the two objectives and this was a kind of uh, semi retrospective the data the study was done in 2016 but the samples which were uh, selected we have repository of about more than 1000 uh, strains so in this only mdr which could be revived and non repetitive samples only from ptb and having well characterized mdr they were included they were uh, mainly from the males adult males and they were all ptb patients and this was the simple algorithm that they were revived uh, from the lj uh, culture and they were uh, single colonies they were revived and they were screened for dna was isolated lp was done and genotyping by spoliotyping was done so what we found that out of the 259 mdr isolates 32 isolates were having pre xdr so this is the what my previous speaker also she said that pre xdr or flux was about 27% we found little similar but little higher that was 32.7% and xdr rate was 6.1% minority it was from one state only and they were not the same same sample which the previous speakers they spoke these strains were from the uh, northwest part of the country that is punjab adjoining to pakistan so the pakistan you know uh, uh, you know delegates can take some message from that we also did genotype and second line it showed the 98.8% and 94% concordance if the uh, isolates were susceptible or they were uh, having the pre xdr but if you see that in the uh, agcp uh, concordance was very very poor and yesterday in the ndwg meeting we had discussion that ethamutol and agcp these are really uh, major concerns and you know both the chair persons were also concerned and this is really because here also as the question was raised that here also obviously the gold standard as of now remains the uh, midget culture so here also as per you know standard guidelines it was taken and therefore yesterday if we take into consideration the yesterday discussions what we had in the wg meeting and our data it you know it matches quite well that the midget and the mutations what we see in the second line particularly in the agcp and uh, the uh, ethamutol they are not very well matching and this is probably not you know you can say that it is less sensitive but we can say as we had discussed yesterday that probably midget misses it so that probably answers your question the most important or most prominent you know mutation what we found that it was d94g and uh, a90v so these were the two most important uh, you know uh, mutations what we found and this was also very common in the xdr isolates the another thing the second objective obviously was the beijing strain uh, the genotyping so we found that beijing strain which is invading in india and we have you know couple of publications in last 2 uh, 3 years that it is migrating and it has reached almost all parts of the country and we found that beijing strain was very very highly associated with the Uh, xdr and pre xdr and of course even though in this part of the you know country that is northwest india we have uh, historically kas strain uh, central asian strain which was predominant earlier now it is becoming number 2 and what we have found that 
even if it is number one uh, in most of the, uh, if you say the total in totality, the country, the cash remains the uh, predominant strain, but the resistance is very very high if you find the Beijing strain. And the Beijing strain was uh, SIT one only, and uh, we also found that most important the uh, the uh, uh, the uh, OFLOX or the pre XDR. They were the both the mutations were very very highly associated with the Beijing strain. So uh, here you can see just a uh, graphical representation. Even though the CAS was most predominant, but the Beijing was obviously the even though it was number two, but the resistance pattern or the association of resistance was highest. The other genotypes were less common. So only we have uh, basically two strains which are circulating in the country. This is again to see the same thing in the uh, diagrammatic uh, representation. The resistance was highest in that. So with that, we can conclude that probably uh, it has the uh, second line probe as assay or the uh, uh, it has very high uh, concordance with the, if you see the sensitivity. Uh, but as far as ethamutol and uh, uh, amino glycosides are concerned, obviously it is not having, but probably we think that it is uh, uh, it is correct and the probably midget is missing so probably uh, we recommend that uh, the program uh, can recommend it uh, very well in the uh, can be rolled out in the program and uh, most of the work uh, was done by uh, Saeed Rufai uh, she was the girl uh, the topic was for her PhD and the spoliotyping typing was done by two other students thank you very much Thank you, thank you. So uh, I'll start, and hopefully this isn't a, a, an unfair question, but uh, so what would you suggest is the role of whole genome sequencing in the, the treatment, uh, diagnosis and treatment of DRTB? Very much, very much. We have already started it, and we have uh, uh, not included in this study, but we have uh, already started working on that, and we are doing on, you know, all the uh, XDR strains particularly and very soon the data will be available for publication here. Uh, other hands, please. Great. Uh, I came from Japan, Jata Arati. And uh, I hope to know how about the frequency of the mutation in the gyrus B. You indicated uh, uh, frequency of the mutation on in the uh, DNA gyrus A. Yeah. Uh, but uh, sometimes, and, uh, not so uh, many, but uh, some rare case uh, uh, in gyrus B, some uh, mutation sometimes identified. What about the uh, frequency of the mutation in the gyrus B in your study? I think uh, there are two answers. One is obviously that LPA doesn't have it. But the second answer also is that, you know, for that reason, chairperson also said, and I am also, you know, seconding it, that, you know, sequencing is the answer, yeah. Right, maybe one more question? Anyone? All right, thank you very thank you. much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Next we have uh, Lavani Joseph. I hope the person is here. No? All right. One less. <laughs> we have a little bit more time for the remaining. Um, then we move on to Wawa Wung um, from Myanmar. I know you are here. <laughs> uh, very good morning, uh, Madam Chairpersons, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to present our study on parasitoma resistance. Um, uh, on back, as a background, Myanmar is one of the world's um, 30 high TB, high MTR TB 
and high HIV TB gantries. And the paracetamide PCIA is a key component in the WHO short course routine uh, for the drug susceptible. And also, it is included in the second line MDITB routine. And also, it's present in the novel rivabacin sparing and then shorter MDITB regime. And then we don't have much uh, PCIA data globally because of the technical challenges of the routine DST for PCIA. That's an and, the, and then the, there are many studies uh, stated that the mutations in the PANG18 uh, can determine the uh, PCA resistance. So our study was carried out to detect the prevalence of the PCA resistance and pattern of the PANG18 mutations in the MTITV strains from YAMA. So the, we collected the um, the, uh, the samples uh, uh, from the patients, student samples from the patients enrolled for the MTITB treatment in 2016 in the two major cities, Yangon and Mandalay in Myanmar. And then uh, uh, they enrolled by the, uh, uh, the diagnosis of the RRTB by the teen, mostly up in the teen age spot. That's why we isolate the um, the MTB by the solid culture, and we confirm the MTRTB status. Uh, and then uh, from this confirmed isolate, from the 45 isolates, we perform the MT uh, PZ image test, 960 meter test, to determine the, the phenotypic drug resistance. And then uh, for the genotypic uh, assay, uh, we extract the DNA and amplify the PANG18, and we did the Sega sequencing by the AVI3500, and then we analyzed the mutations. As a result, uh, for the PISA resistance, uh, we can find the phenotypic resistance in 26 isolates, and then the mutation in the 27 isolates, and there was a strong agreement between the phenotypic and genotypic assay with the kappa of Y9. And then the uh, mutation pattern are very diverse, and then uh, we found the 31 different mutations and on the uh, PPEG-18 and on its promoter region on the 26 uh, phenotypically resistant isolates, and then the 10 were not found in the other studies. And then we can find the uh, two isolate each of the, these um, uh, common mutations in the nucleotide regions. So for the discussion and conclusion, uh, because uh, the, the, the um, uh, WHO recently carried out a multi-country survey on the um, five countries, I think, um, and it reported the PSA resistance, it's a wide range, 3 to 42 uh, percent, depending on the different type of this, uh, the study population. And it also found that the, in the, uh, it is higher in the RR, rapamycin resistant TB cases. Our study shows the high PSA resistance, and the, uh, these highlights the need for the effective treatment regime for the PSA resistance MTI TB cases. And as we found the um, concordance, DNA co sequencing can consider as an alternative method to, for to detect the PCA resistance. And the, uh, our mutation pattern uh, can be accumulated information for the uh, for the test. And then the, we indicate routing DST can be co incorporated in the treatment monitoring and the, uh, and the routing DR service. That's why we support the, uh, what Dr. Zengal uh, said. Uh, we need to rethink our surveillance approach to improve the understanding of the PSA resistance in different settings and the patient group. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much for thank you very much for this interesting data, Dr. Ong. Obviously shocking. We just saw 30% fluoroquinolone resistance. Uh, I don't know what the rates are in in, in Myanmar, but then 60% uh, PSA resistance. Yes. I mean, it all speaks like that we should get a rapid third line DST. And as we heard from Dr. Singh, probably sequencing is the way to go. Would you agree with that? Yes. Yes. And what would you think the 
priorities are to, to target PZA definitely first? Yeah. Yes. Um, actually, the for the PZA resistance, actually, our my sample size is rather small, but we are continuing because we say it's not a, not a rigid test, and then we found them. Um, because uh, I think uh, maybe the, the now we are studying on the drug susceptible one that, that we may find the different figure and then continuing the other uh, drug resistant isolates. But the, uh, the PSA resistance uh, is a debating issue because uh, whether the PSA resistance can d determine the final outcome. And then the, the, that's why even we agreed for the incorporation of the DSD. Uh, because in Myanmar, and as in other developing countries, we have the uh, many XDR, many fluoroquinolone, second line, injectable. So the whether, uh, I am suggesting that, uh, whether I recommend the incorporation of PZA to the uh, uh, drug resistant routing, can we do that? And then this is the, my first, uh, yeah, my, my opinion. And then the, for the DNA sequencing, uh, for the DNA sequence, but the PSA mutation is uh, uh, quite very diverse. And then the, I saw that the Japanese group reported in the 2017 the um, new test uh, for the Lyme group assay to test. And I found it is quite promising. And it, it covers the 49 uh, mutation and uh, with the two incorporation of the two, you know, the mutation points, which are the genotypic specific or same thing. But um, for this, uh, because uh, we have to, that's why the it's difficult to answer, you know, the sequencing or the lime packets. We have the, um, I, uh, study more, collect the data globally. That's why the, uh, for to answer your question, the priority is to to detect the PSA resistance in different types of population in different region, and then we can consider. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions from the group? Just a quick uh, note, maybe on this LPA PZA. I think one of the co-authors of the study that's currently under review on the LPA PZA from the Nipro uh, Corporation in Japan yeah. is currently under review, showing very promising data. Yeah. Unfortunately, we do not see the company actually taking the path to a WHO yes. review. So unfortunately, Sven Hoffner is here, that's who I was looking for. Um, unfortunately, we don't see a path forward uh, to get this test onto the uh, global fund uh, list. Yeah. Congratulations for, for the nice study. Uh, we know from recent studies that there are mutations that could be non-synonymous that does not necessarily affect the function of the PNCI protein. And that can be evidenced by the fact that these strains can hydrolyze piracinamide and they are weight positive. Have you checked for that, uh, for all the mutations that you have shown? Uh, have you checked for other mutations on other candidate genes for PCA resistance? Uh, actually, the, this is the kind of the, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, because uh, the, our PCA studies is still ongoing and then the, and then the, we aim for the, the uh, the, the for the further the protein study, and then the actually we missed the here the weight test also, and then that's why the I think uh, for the for the time being I can present this, and then maybe the the, the for the, the complete study we can present more and then incorporate uh, the other you know the functional gene uh, for the further in depth study for the PSA yes. Uh, yeah, so if I may take the luxury of uh, asking another question, or perhaps this is a comment. So um, it's really nice to see you looking further into uh, pyrazinamide resistance testing, because uh, I think the drug, of course, is not going to go away anytime soon, is it? Uh, it's, uh, it's part of the shorter regimen. It's uh, perhaps being planned to add on to the BPAL regimen and NICS, and everyone just believes in the magic of PZA, right? So it's going to be here for <laughs> forever. Uh, and it, luckily, it's not that toxic, right? So, but um, what frustrates me is um, in countries that do do PZA resistance testing right now, um, no one believes the results. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so to me, then it's like, well, why are we doing it if the clinicians don't know whether to trust the results, you know, what it means, whether you know, in a given context, if they're pyrazinamide resistant, can you use the shorter regimen 
or does that automatically mean you have to go to an individualized regimen? So perhaps um, your thoughts on how we can best create a believable result for pyrazinamide resistance? Yes. It's so quite a large question. Yes. Uh, because I have the same comment, uh, because uh, from the previous symposium, uh, that, that's why uh, that, uh, one of our physician, we said the BZA resistance, and then you said um, there is no standard for the uh, BZA. The DSD, um, the, the, the acidic gacha, the solid gacha is not helpful. And then even the midget, midget is not the, uh, you know. So the, you know, that, because it's difficult for me to answer because nobody got the, uh, the, the, the black or white issue. That's why I'm thinking, because I'm doing the PSA, the, sometimes I'm thinking that whether it should draw the, uh, you know, it, it, it includes all the regime, but the, we cannot say it is resistant or the, and then it could draw the other attention from the physician or the policy maker. But I think it is still important because, uh, yeah, <laughs> we have to still, we still have to find out, I think. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very, very quick. <laughs> yes, we're already six minutes over for the session, sir. Uh, only to answer a little bit your, your, your question is because some uh, piracinamide, the, uh, the PNCA gene that has mutation, that's uh, still, uh, uh, they are not resistant. Because we need, I think, to change the critical concentration in the midget because now it's 100 micrograms per ml. So it suggests to be 300 because there are some mutations that are still sensitive. So we cannot change our result. All right, we'll see what comes out of the critical concentration review from the WHO, which should be published soon. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe we'll leave this as a comment and, yeah. then, and then move on. I think the next uh, speaker, thank you very much, Dr. Um. The next speaker, we are again not sure if he's here, Edson Molal. Edson? Anyone? Once, twice, no? Third? No, all right. Um, then we'll move on to Ruin Chu. Chao. <laughs> Apologies. Ruin Chao um, from Taiwan. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Um, I'd like to um, share with you our results on the uh, determination of the two drug sensitivity of microbacterial tuberculosis using the quantitative minimum inhibitory concentration test. Uh, on behalf of my two colleagues, Mei Hua Wu and Wang Xuanlin, they are they're the person working on the lab works. Uh, before I get into the results of the study, I would like to show you some of the background information, uh, which is on the instance of TB and R and MDR TB in Taiwan. As you can see, even though we implement a national TB control program, we are able to bring down the uh, new TB cases around 77 uh, percent from 2005 to 2016. By the year 2016, the instant rate is still uh, 44 per 100,000. Even that, uh, however, you can see here, the MDRTV cases to account for 1 percent of our annual knee TB cases. As for the revamping recent cases, the highest rate is in uh, 2010, which is 2 percent and gradually decreased. As you can, some of the more recent rate listing here for revomacy for new cases is 2%. Among the previously treated cases, 10%. As for NH recent, among new cases, 9%. Previously treated cases is uh, 18%. Because of the, uh, we have to tackle the challenges of uh, MDRTV cases in our program. So uh, we have CDC implements of uh, Treatment MDRTB treatment consortium or DOTS Plus program in 2007. So I think that everybody uh, know the importance of uh, results of the DST for guiding the uh, treatment, also the management of uh, uh, MDR uh, drug resistant TB cases. So we decided to carry out uh, a study 
um, carefully select 173 MDR TB isolates, including some of the pre SDR and SDR cases, uh, strains. The drug uh, resistant profile, sorry, oops. The drug resistant profile we're showing here. Uh, the uh, cost is rate among uh, rifabutin is 88%, and recent to um, S-N-Butyl is 59%, streptomycin 49%, unfortunately recent to PCA is only 32%, and this study cohort. Um, we, um, uh, today I'm going to just report to you seven drugs we tested, uh, we are including two voroquinolones, which are moloxifosacin, levofosacin, and three uh, cicline injectable drugs, which are uh, carbamycin, amikacin, and capromycin. We also test uh, the SN, SLM and SNbutyl. The method we're using are agar proportion method. This is currently the routine uh, test carried out in our clinical laboratories, and we are also using the uh, liquid-based sensitizer plates and also a custom panel for quantitative MIC testing. And copper value was calculated to compare these two methods. So this is uh, because uh, we have a uh, restricted number of slides. So I'm not able to show some of the uh, pretty figures. But I want to, uh, just want to know, let you know that based on the accumulated frequency and accumulated percentage of recent and susceptible strengths, and also uh, we uh, calculate the egg off value and also including the syntax of each drugs. Now we identify MIC cutoff values of those 70 drugs tested. So the MIC, the suggested MIC is for bronxifosacin was 0 0.5 microgram per mil, for levofosacin is 0.5, carmacin 4, amikacin 4, capomycin 2, and for zeolomy 2.5 microgram per mil, and asambutyl 1 microgram per mil. If we including excluding strengths with intermediate MIC values, our result showed that the those two measures had a very good correlation except SLMI. The agreement between the, those two measures about proportion measure and the MIC measures are um, mostly 99% level for sussing, 99% carmycin 99% as well, amikacin 100%, capomycin 100%, isra ermi 89%, and SMbutyl 98%. Based on the results of COPPA uh, analysis, uh, the results reveal that intermediate values needed to be suggested and reported for each test drug, which I'm showing the summary of the results in this table here. Uh, as you can see, the drugs uh, tested were listed here, and the um, concentration test is here. So the concentration range for MOXI uh, for quinolones are the same, for also for the cyclone drugs are the same. And this is a range for SLMI, this is a range for SMbutyl. And uh, this is a critical concentration currently recommended, but as we know, it might be a uh, review. Uh, so we might need to recalculate these results. But anyway, based on uh, the uh, original suggest critical concentration here, and uh, this is the uh, MIC cutoff I just show you for uh, mostly uh, it's 0 0.5, and this is the intermediate uh, um, MIC showing here. And the copper value between the bound C, these two measures, 0 0.93, level 0 0.97, carmycin 0 0.94, for amikacin and capomycin above 1, and isoramycin 0 0.63, SMPTO 0 0.96. So in conclusion, critical concentration is determined using the AGA proportion measure was within the MIC value of drugs recent and susceptible strains determined using the liquid-based DST. Our findings suggest the importance of using quantitative liquid-based DST to determine the true drug sensibility and to report intermediate values for preserving effective anti-TB drugs. The other thing I want to mention, even though uh, the AGA proportion test as a susceptible strength, uh, in our uh, MIC results also show intermediate. So it's very really confusing um, 
uh, how to report the um, ROS just based on the AGA proportion method. So currently, we uh, report to clinician uh, not, not only the AGA proportion method results, but also the uh, mutations of the, um, of, of the uh, gene uh, analyzed. And we consider to provide also the MIC methods in the near future. Thanks. Great. So um, if you, uh, as you suggest in your conclusion slide, if you start to re report on those intermediate value results, right. do you feel confident that you could then correlate that with clinical decisions as to how to, how to dose the drugs or give the drugs? Oh, yeah. It's, it's a good question. Uh, even though we are giving the results uh, to the clinician on those uh, difficult or special cases right now, but that thing's there's uh, caused some of the confusions so we have to, uh, you know, so give so many results, agar proportion, gene mutations, and also the MIC results. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. Oh, good. Thank you for reporting this interesting study. I'm also a great supporter of the intermediate category. And I think it's used for all other bacteria except for TB. So I think that clinicians could be able to understand how to use the intermediate criteria also for TB. But I'm interested to hear on how did you define your intermediate category? Because that is not always that easy to know what is really the intermediate category. Right. Yeah. Oh. Well, um, unfortunately, I don't have the uh, figures up here. As I just told you, we also including the echo value and the CMAX value here. So you can see there's a region. Um, it's not belong to the successful reason. So we really define those uh, concentration in the middle as an intermediate concentration. I can show you the figure later. Other questions? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, last but not least, we have uh, Jeff Collins from Emory University in the US. Okay, thank you everyone for sticking with me at the uh, coveted pre lunch presentation slot. Uh, all right, so I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, using plasma metabolomics to differentiate patients with drug-resistant TB from those with drug-susceptible disease. So uh, I just want to start off by giving a little bit of an overview about what exactly is metabolomics, because I think there's a lot of confusion with all the omics methods that are out there. So metabolomics essentially is a study of all small molecules that are the result of all cellular processes in a biologic system. So that biologic system can be as small as a single cell, could be as large as a human being, and that's the context that we're going to be talking about today. So newly developed methods in ultra-high resolution metabolomics now allow us to measure over 20,000 molecules in plasma samples. And while the vast majority of these molecules are derived from human metabolic processes, this sensitivity also gives us the ability to measure metabolites from the environment and environmental exposures, as well as infecting microorganisms, including those derived from the cell wall of mycobacterium tuberculosis in infected patients. So I have just a little schematic of the MTB cell wall, and I think this is of particular interest in terms of biomarker development, mainly because of the abundance and diversity of glycolipids that are present in the cell wall that are not present in human cells. So in vitro experiments suggest that there is significant remodeling of these glycolipids that occurs in drug-resistant mutants. We therefore sought to determine whether targeted plasma metabolic profiling of some of these MTB-derived lipids could potentially differentiate those with multidrug-resistant TB from those with drug-susceptible disease. 
So uh, to answer this question, we enrolled 61 HIV-negative patients uh, from the country of Georgia. All patients had a positive AFB sputum smear as well as a positive sputum culture for mycobacterium tuberculosis. All patients were initially started on standard first-line drug therapy with rifampin, isoniazid, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol for the first eight weeks. We also collected sputum culture for drug resistance testing at baseline, and 44 of the 61 patients were subsequently found to have drug susceptible TB, and then upon further testing, 17 patients were later found to have MDR TB and were therefore receiving suboptimal therapy for the first eight weeks of the study. So we collected plasma samples uh, at study enrollment, which could have been anywhere from zero to seven days after treatment start. Uh, everyone in the cohort received, uh, I believe, at least three days of treatment uh, before being enrolled. Uh, and then we also collected plasma at four weeks and after eight weeks of treatment. We measured plasma metabolites using a combination of liquid chromatography and mass spectrometry, as is the protocol in our metabolomics lab. And then we matched mycobacterium tuberculosis lipid candidates by both accurate mass measurements and retention time measurements that were published in a, uh, in a, a library that's publicly available of MTB-derived lipid metabolites. So just looking at the cohort in terms of uh, the clinical disease that was present at baseline, you can see uh, very similar uh, rates of cavitary disease uh, between the drug susceptible and the MDR-TB group, about 20% in both. There were very few patients in the entire cohort, only two that had extra pulmonary disease. And the proportion of patients with a high-grade AFB sputum smear, as well as the proportion with a high colony count on semi-quantitative culture uh, of MTB were, were also similar. Unsurprisingly, the only significant difference between the two groups was the proportion of patients who had converted their sputum culture after eight weeks of treatment, 93% in the drug susceptible group and less than 50% in the MDR-TB group. So in this cohort, we measured 13,541 metabolites. Uh, of those metabolites, 464 had accurate mass matches to metabolites that were cataloged in our uh, MTB lipid metabolite database of interest. And of the 30 metabolites that were significantly different between the drug susceptible and the MDR-TB group, 28 were actually decreased in the MDR-TB group. And so uh, I, I've just depicted some representative examples of, of these uh, metabolites here. Um, the, uh, on the x-axis, we have a week of treatment, and then uh, on the y-axis, we have the intensity of the metabolite, which is uh, essentially a semi-quantitative measure of concentration of the metabolite in plasma. And you can see that for all these metabolites, the drug-susceptible TB group, which is depicted with the blue line, has a significant increase in the intensity of each metabolite, really starting from baseline. Uh, and continuing throughout the initial treatment phase relative to those with MDR-TB depicted by the red line, uh, which are, are much lower through the uh, entire treatment course. So the conclusions of our study were that the intensity of multiple MTB lipid metabolites were significantly lower in MDR-TB patients compared to those with drug-susceptible TB, both at baseline and for the duration of the initial treatment phase. Given the universal nature of the effect, 28 out of, 20, out of 30 metabolites being decreased in the MDR-TB group, we think this may be effect of increased bacterial killing in patients with drug-susceptible disease relative to those with MDR-TB, but it's also possible that there could be some component of cell wall reorganization that we're detecting. Uh, increased concentrations of those MTB metabolites could potentially be an early indicator of effective antibiotic therapy. And our next steps are going to be pursuing chemical verification of many of these detected metabolites, as well as trying to validate them in a larger, more diverse cohort of active TB patients uh, undergoing treatment. So with that, I'd just like to thank you, uh, say thank you to our funders, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for this very innovative approach, interesting data. Um, you're mentioning already here that you're looking potentially as considering this also for treatment monitoring. So what is, aside from the chemical verification, your next step in a, like a larger cohort, evaluating this in a larger cohort, are there any plans? And how do you think a test would look like if we were to base it on your data? 
Well, so, um, uh, yeah, so uh, a couple questions there. Um, so, you know, as far as uh, potentially using this for treatment monitoring, uh, I think it's, uh, we're uh, still a little bit in the infancy of this technology. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I say that mainly because um, we still don't have a, a great sense of how quickly these metabolites appear after someone is initiated on therapy. And then also we don't have a great sense of their half-life, how long they last, how long they are detectable in plasma. So I, I can, you know, as you could see from, from the figures, uh, we're still detecting them after eight weeks of treatment. So, um, you know, uh, kind of using them to determine cure or uh, risk of relapse, uh, I think could potentially be a little bit trickier just because uh, we don't really know if, if we expect them to be completely gone and if they're not gone, if that's actually indicative of ongoing replication. Um, how I would see this, uh, this particular data being potentially useful in the clinical world, I think uh, would really be uh, uh, not necessarily an absolute determination of drug resistance, because I'm not sure that it's possible using this technology. But I do think that if you could identify some biomarkers that could help risk stratify people and, you know, kind of give a, a signature that indicated that someone after being initiated on first-line drugs was at very high risk to have drug resistance, I think that could help countries triage uh, who they're actually having formal drug susceptibility testing uh, done on, given that that's still not universally available. Thank you. Another question here. from Ames, New Delhi. Uh, just I want to ask uh, in MDR, uh, you have just uh, shown uh, you have some MDR patient. Do, uh, do you have any difference between primary MDR and uh, secondary MDR data for this uh, metabolites? Uh, so just to make sure I'm understanding your question, are you, you want to know about the diversity of the, of the, of the MDR TB uh, cohort that was followed in this study? How different are they from one another? Yeah, you, you, just, you are just uh, showing uh, there's some sample uh, metabolites, 28 yeah. metabolites you have just found in, uh, not found in MDR patient. R or, well, so they're, they're uh, found just at lower uh, concentration. Lower concentration, yeah. whether they are the MDR, primary MDR or secondary MDR. I see. That no, so we don't. So yeah, yeah. So this is this is uh, so that level of data, yeah, wasn't uh, wasn't collected for the study. So this is just purely based on phenotypic uh, drug resistance to rifampin and isoniazid. Um, so that kind of uh, uh, clinical history is not known. There might be some changes in whenever the primary MDR, uh, primary MDR, uh, they, uh, they have little bit different. There, there might be some little bit. Um, uh, metabolites uh, yeah. increase or decrease but in secondary they are created MDR right so there might be some yeah no I think that's definitely a good suggestion and I can tell you that uh, we're uh, currently kind of assembling a much larger cohort to try and validate these and there's uh, we have a lot more diversity in terms of the uh, kind of methods of acquisition of drug resistance and also the types of drug resistance so hopefully in that study I think we can get down to a little bit more of a granular level as far as the extent of the drug resistance and how it was acquired. Just one follow-up, that data should be available in programmatic uh, data. So N Nistani, who I think you're working yeah. with there, should be able to get that data for you. One more question. Yeah, so we also did some study in the sequential isolates. And we you know, isolated when it was susceptible, then uh, you know, one drug, two drug, and sequentially. So mm -hmm. four isolates, sequential yeah. isolates, already published in uh, 2015. And the, uh, what we found, you know, interestingly, just opposite. Some of the genes were overexpressed in the MDR. When it became MDR, the genes which were not you know, overexpressed during the early you know, baseline mm -hmm. susceptibility stage, so they got overexpressed. And these are the proteins which we have found uh, for the TRIES test already published in uh, scientific reports. So these antigens we are taking as you know, a marker for the, you know. So uh, your finding, you know, it was just opposite. So because usually when there is a drug, there is a, you know, uh, the, uh, the pressure on the bacteria. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how you can explain that, you know, uh, when there is a pressure and why these metabolites should be low. Yeah, so, um, so I, I think as far as the, uh, you know, I, I think in terms of thinking about difference of uh, protein antigens, I think the translation from gene mutation expression to protein transcription uh, is 
something that's been worked out a little bit more clearly uh, in uh, in vitro studies. I think uh, you know the in vitro studies that have been done looking at cell wall reorganization related to gene mutations. Um, it, you know the the phenotype has been described. I think the mechanism uh, of how it gets there is much less clear, other than just kind of a general hypothesis that the rifampin resistance mutations that alter gene transcription are ultimately uh, going to impact every part of the cell. So uh, I think there's more work to be done there as far as working that out. Um, however, I think that also, uh, you know, it's very possible that the results we're seeing uh, don't necessarily, uh, aren't necessarily due to uh, a mechan, don't necessarily have an, a mechanistic underpinning and could potentially be a reflection of therapy. Um, it would really be great if everyone in our cohort had gotten zero days of TB treatment when they were enrolled, but as everyone in the room knows, that's very difficult to achieve. Um, and so, you know, these people were already on therapy when a lot of the killing occurs. So uh, we, it's possible that we're just picking up that signal. One more question here. Yeah. I just had uh, two quick comments. First of all, thank you for an excellent presentation. The second thing to uh, answer the question, all the MDR cases were primary MDR TB. Oh. So these were all newly diagnosed patients in the cohort that was leveraged from a uh, randomized controlled trial carried out in Georgia. Thanks for that clarification. Any other question? No. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> How could I? <laughs> yeah, I think, um, have you considered whether this would apply to latent TB infection and, and progression to disease? I know that's a, a, a whole other can of worms. Yeah, yeah, no, so uh, we have uh, thought about that and um, we're, we're trying to work that out uh, right now. So, you know, we uh, have also, uh, as you might imagine, looked at this type of data cross-sectionally just for diagnostic purposes. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there definitely are, as you might expect, uh, uh, several metabolites that we can identify that separate uh, um, people who have active TB from household contacts. Um, but, you know, household contacts is a very nebulous control group. Uh, and so we are actually in the process right now of uh, trying to uh, uh, kind of validate the findings with uh, more specific control groups, specifically people who we think about as likely as you can possibly ascertain have latent TB, as well as those who we think, you know, have almost no risk of exposure. And then I think once we start to be able to uh, look at those control groups on a little bit more granular level, we might be able to see whether, you know, kind of what the potential is as far as identifying people who, who may progress or may be at high risk. Yeah, I do think if we can eventually get to biomarkers as a, as a better correlate of response to treatment and, uh, and cure, uh, then having to rely on culture, which takes so long, and smear, which is so inexact, um, I think you'll get the Nobel Prize. So, <laughs> so okay, keep up right, the good there you work. Go. I'll uh, work on that. Okay, good. good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks very much. All right, thank you. Good. So with that, we come to an end. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you to the speakers for some excellent presentation, very innovative and interesting data. And yes, have fun at the conference.